All right, folks, welcome back. We're going to talk a little bit today about natural selection. Talk a little bit about how that plays a role in how organisms change over time. We're talking a little bit about evolution and how uh, natural selection plays a role in evolution, how it is a mechanism of evolution. It is the reason or it is a method in which uh, evolution takes place. So we will take a look at that today and hopefully get a good understanding of it, all right? So our objectives today, you should be able to explain the process of evolution and natural selection. Understand how Charles Darwin developed the theory of evolution by natural selection and predict the evolution of species in a variety of scenarios. So it's one thing to just be able to know evolution and natural selection, but it's another, another to be able to utilize that into predicting how organisms and species will change over time. So I think that's an important concept to understand, and that's something that we're going to look at here a little bit later on. Any questions? Let's get started. So before Charles Darwin, before uh, we had a lot of scientific discovery about the origins of life, many originally believed that the world was about 6,000 years old. And this was a common, uh, this is a common belief amongst most people in the world. Uh, Charles Darwin took a voyage to survey the coast of South America in 1831 on board the HMS Beagle. And he spent a lot of time collecting biological data of many different organisms. He spent a lot of time just recording data, taking down information, and documenting what he saw along the coast of South America. This information that he discovered helped lead him to the concept of natural selection. Um, and off the coast of South America, Darwin found that the islands of the Galapagos, you know, these islands had similar species to those on South America, but had slight differences. They weren't really dramatic differences, but they were very, very slight, such as birds and had their beak size, all right, as a good example of this. He deduced from this, because they were so similar to those on the mainland of South America, that the species of the Galapagos must have originated in the mainland and then changed after they had gotten to the islands, okay? So, how does this change take place is what he's trying to figure out. Why do these organisms look slightly different? Why do these organisms look slightly different than those that are on the mainland? That was his big question that he could not understand and could not explain. So what Darwin did is he spent a lot of time back home trying to think about how those traits could have changed. How could an organism that looks very, very similar to the ones on the mainland has something that makes them slightly different in a different environment. So Darwin began to experiment when he got back to England. He began to breed pigeons for certain traits like fan-shaped tails because they were best for flying and found that fan-shaped tail organisms tend to produce fan-shaped tail offspring. Now, we know this now that tall people tend to produce tall offspring or short people tend to produce short offspring. Uh, you know all of this based upon concepts of breeding. Um, things like dog breeding. We know that we can breed certain types of dog or certain traits for dog if we get those traits that are found in the parents. All right? We know that now because of our uh, what we know about genetics. This was called artificial selection because he was the one who was determining what traits were being passed on from one generation to the next. So if you wanted a specific breed of dog, you would try to get two dogs that had the traits that you want, have them mate, and then those traits would more than likely be present in the offspring. We do this nowadays for corn. We breed corn for specific traits like high yield or you know, resistance to insects or resistance to... Uh, disease and drought and things like that. Cats are the same way. We breed cats for certain traits. So this art, concept of artificial selection was that Darwin was able to select certain traits and pass those on to the offspring. Darwin was able to select certain traits that were passed on from generation to generation over time. All right, And over a long period of time, he was able to create new breeds of dogs or cats or things like that. That was the concept that he was thinking about, was being able to select for certain traits, and then those traits get passed on to the offspring. Now, the concept of natural selection, and this was kind of the big idea here, 
was that Darwin concluded that trait selection could occur in nature if one trait gave an advantage over another, right? You think about this, tall sunflowers have an advantage in the environment over short, sun, sun, short sunflowers. It's hard to say. The tall sunflowers are able to reach the sunlight that is necessary for survival. The short sunflowers cannot. So if the tall sunflowers survive, they get to reproduce. And we all know that tall sunflowers will typically have sunflower offspring that are tall. So over time, this trait selection could create a change in a species. All right, fantails for flying. If this gives an advantage, say fantails give an advantage to pigeons because they're able to fly away from predators easier. Fantails survive. Fantailed pigeons get to reproduce, and their offspring will have fantails. Those that don't have fantails will not get to chance to reproduce as much because they have a lower chance of survival. Giraffe neck. Look at the picture to the right. The taller neck on the giraffe allows it to reach the food. The short neck of the giraffe on the left does not allow it to reach the food. The one on the left will not survive. The one on the right will. If you get to survive, you get to reproduce. If you reproduce, your offspring are going to have similar traits to that of the parent. All right? So what we see here is that long necks, you'll see them more frequently in future giraffe populations because that is a trait that gives the giraffes an advantage. All right? Now, this is not something that happens quickly. This is not something that happens in one, two, three, even a hundred generations. This is something that happens over a long time long period of time, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of years of natural selection takes place for there to be a significant change in an organism. It's not something that happens overnight, and it's not something that you will see instantaneously. It's something that has to occur over a long period of time. We know that genes are passed on to offspring, and that kind of gives us this idea of natural selection. So you look at this chart here. It's an excellent example. Let's say natural selection selects for the darker colored duck. These things look like ducks, right? Let's say the natural selection selects for the darker colored duck. All right, and so over generations of time, we see the lighter colors are selected against. Those are the ones that die and do not get to reproduce. But the darker ones do get to reproduce. And as a result, we see that over time, the darker ducks prevail. All right? And this is because of natural selection. The darker ones survive, reproduce, and pass those genes on to their offspring. Because we know that dark ducks typically have offspring that are dark, right? So you see the change in alleles. We see the change in genetics over time. And as a result, we end up with a duck population that is slightly different. Very similar to how the beak population on the Galapagos Islands was slightly different. And this is because of the environment in which they're placed. The environment controls how natural selection takes place. Darwin published his book on the origin of species in 1859, and this describes the process of natural selection, or the idea that the organisms can change over time due to selective pressures of nature. Again, organisms do not want to change. It is not the want. It isn't even the need to change. But rather, organisms change over time because nature selects for certain traits. In nature, there are certain traits that are going to benefit an organism, and those differ depending upon the environment in which they're placed. Adven advantages for an organism in a forest are going to be different than that, than the advantages of a something that lives in the desert. All right? So these changes over time are due to the pressures of nature, and evolution just refers to the change in organisms over time. Natural selection is a mechanism of evolution. It is one way that evolution can take place. There are other ways as well. We're not going to go into a whole lot of them in this unit, but natural selection is the main one I want you to understand, that those traits can change over time due to nature and due to the selective pressures that exist in nature. Now, there's a big misconception out here that humans evolved from gorillas, and I just want to make sure to understand that this is not what science believes. Science does not believe that humans evolved from gorillas because we both exist at the same time. That is not how evolution takes place. Humans and gorillas may have shared a common ancestor. So you look at this, this is called a clodogram. 
All right, this shows common ancestry. So we look here on the chart, we see a chimpanzee, bonobo, and human, and they all share a common ancestor, which is believed to have occurred about 6 million years ago. This common ancestor evolved or changed due to natural selection into different species over time because of different environments, all right? That common ancestor may have existed over a long split, long, uh, may have existed in a large area. And then over time, those environments changed. And then certain traits that became beneficial became more prevalent in the species over time because of the pressures of nature, all right? So we can see here that for sure, humans did not evolve from gorillas, but they may have shared a common ancestor, all right? So what is some evidence for evolution? How do we know that evolution has taken place? And there are several different key evidences for evolution. The first is the fossil record. And the fossil record shows how ancient species are similar to current species on Earth. We can see how the species have changed over time based upon the physical traits that are given in the fossil record for certain characteristics. Um, for example, like arms and legs, um, certain characteristics in the skull, which is what we're looking at here on the right. We can see that the more similar that our skulls are to the fossils, the more closely we are related to the organism in terms of our common ancestry. All right? So we look at the fossil record to give key evidences for evolution. We also look at anatomy, and we can see that different structures, even though they may have different functions, um, actually look quite similar. Uh, let's talk about homologous structures, and those are structures that are similar to a common ancestor. Now, they may not have the same function, all right? So we look at the first picture on the top right here. We see that a whale, a frog, a horse, a lion, a human, a bat, and a bird, all of those structures of the arms, legs, and wings are very similar to each other, and this suggests that all of those organisms may have shared a common ancestor at one point in time, that they're all relatively closely related. All right, and these are what are called homologous structures because these structures are similar to each other and help us understand that they may have shared a common ancestor at one point. Vestigial structures also help us understand that we may have shared a common ancestor because these are structures that are once used by a common ancestor but are no longer used. Things like ear muscles, tonsils, wisdom teeth, appendix, body hair, your tailbone, all right? All of these are vestigial structures. We don't necessarily need them for survival, all right? But there may have been evidence that they may have been used by a common ancestor. For example, the appendix is to believed, is believed to have once been used to digest cellulose, all right? And cellulose is a sugar that is found in plants that we as humans cannot digest. So it was believed that our appendix was once used as that from a common ancestor. Uh, wisdom teeth were once used to chew that cellulose and be able to break that down all right. Our um, body hair is used for warmth and protection. It's no longer necessary for that anymore. So vestigial structures used by a common ancestor but are no longer used by an organism. Analogous structures have the same purpose but not from a common ancestor. So you think things like butterfly wings and bat wings. They are not similar in structure at all. All right. But they share a similar purpose. Now these structures do not show evolutionary uh, relatedness, all right? These do not show how closely we are related to other organisms, but rather they're just there to help us get a better understanding of how different organisms and their traits have evolved and changed over time. So make sure you know these three terms, homologous, similar in structure, ne not necessarily similar in function, vestigial, no longer used by an organism, and analogous, the same purpose but not from a common ancestor. Other evidence for evolution includes things like embryology, which shows similarities in an organism's development over time, and shared features show a common ancestor. So you see here that at the beginning, we look very, very similar to pigs, tortoises, and lizards over time. All right, we share a lot more in common with the pig, right? You look at that second picture, you see that it's a lot more, uh, a lot similar to the pig than it is to the tortoise and lizard, and that is because we are more closely related so common features typically show a common ancestor. We can look at embryos and see how closely they are related to other organisms. And biochemistry, which is the most common one we look at. The more similarities we have in our DNA, the closer the common ancestor. 
We share about 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees. It's quite amazing to think about that 2% of the DNA makes up most of that difference. But if you think about this, it makes a lot of sense. We share about 50% of our DNA with bananas. And you think about how is that possible we're so different, but you think about all the things that the banana needs to do that's similar to what the human needs to do. It needs to perform mitosis. It needs to perform multitude, many, many thousands of different cellular functions that are very similar to that of the human. It needs to grow and develop. It needs to be able to do everything that is necessary for life. So most of the DNA we are going to share with other organisms, but it's the little 1% to 2% differences that make up who we are as individuals and make up who we are as a species. All right, it's very, very fascinating. So hopefully you understand a little bit about the process of evolution and natural selection, that certain traits are selected for by nature. Those traits give those organisms an advantage. Those organisms get to survive, reproduce, and pass those traits onto their offspring. As a result, we see more organisms with the advantageous trait over time. Hopefully you understand how Charles Darwin developed this theory of evolution by natural selection by visiting the Galapagos Islands and experimenting with pigeons at home using artificial selection. And you should be able to predict the evolution of a species in a variety of different scenarios. So hopefully you get a good understanding of evolution. We'll talk a little bit more about this and we'll give you some more uh, experiments to go through and practice with this over time. Make sure you take your video quiz. Have a good day, guys. We'll talk to you later.